Hi everybody, I'm Tony E at JoyP Interface Brief, and today I'm going to show you how to run EVNG on Google's cloud platform. I want to start off by doing a full disclosure. Um, this is not something that I discovered or am the first to do by any means. In fact, all of the research to pull this off is owed to um, the uh, IT Hitman blog post, which I'm going to share over here on the screen. Um, I followed the, these steps pretty closely. The reason I wanted to make this video is to go ahead and document the process as well as there were a couple of steps uh, that weren't very clear uh, and I wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to share that with everybody else because I had to go and ask for help um, in some other communities and people were able to volunteer some help to help me solve these problems. Also, this is a very detailed blog post. Um, it's really great. It has a lot of screenshots, follows step by step. But even with that, it was rather intimidating not being familiar with Google Cloud's platform. So I want to go ahead and document the process here in video to show you how you can get it up and running in about less than an hour. Let's start off by going to cloud.google.com. If you haven't already signed up for Google's cloud platform, um, there's going to be a sign up button down here at the bottom or sign up at the top. If you have a Gmail account or you already have a Google Cloud, if you have a Gmail account and you haven't signed up for Google Cloud yet, if you sign up, you get 300 free dollars to, of Google's money to spend. Um, you have to put in your billing information. Um, that's how they uh, get you to activate your account. You have to put in your billing information, but you get 300 free dollars that you get to burn through first. And you might be asking yourself, how far will $300 get me? Well, once we get into the demo here, I'll show you just how far $300 will get you. I'm already logged in with my account, and I already have um, activated my free trial, so I'm going to go straight to go to console. Now, if you haven't done anything with Google Cloud's platform before, you'll be brought to this welcome screen. Uh, this is going to give you some tutorials, some how-tos to get some basic stuff done. Um, I've been through this a couple of times, so I'm just going to dive right in. The first thing I want you to do is to select a project. We're going to create a new project. You're probably thinking, what is a project? A project is just a name that you can group resources together um, to attach to billing resources. Those resources could be storage resources, compute resources, network resources that all get put into a project that you can tie to billing. So let's go over here to new project. And we just have to fill in a couple of bits of information. We have to give it a name um, and we can ignore the organization uh, for now since this is a personal project. I'm going to call it EVNG. I'm going to click create. If your project isn't selected, click the drop down Select your project and click Open. You can access the Home console screen for your project by clicking the navigation three bars at the upper left and clicking Home. This is not unlike any other HTML5 dashboard uh, where you're presented with a number of tiles that you can customize. We want to click on our Activate Cloud Shell, which is going to open a little terminal at the bottom of the screen. Here is where we're going to use a command from the IT Hitman blog which is going to allow us to create a custom image. We're going to be using an Ubuntu um, a base image, and we're going to build it custom to allow for nested virtualization. EVNG, in order to run, requires nested virtualization. Um, and so we're going to uh, build an image that allows that here. I have the uh, command copied to my clipboard, and I'll put it in the show notes below. I'll control V to paste it in. This command can be broken up into a couple of sections. We're invoking gcloud, the compute resources, images, which is a subcontext under compute, and we want to create an image named nested vert ubuntu. We're using the Ubuntu um, OS cloud as a source. The image family is 1604 LTS, which is the um, image that EVNG is built on. And then here's the license value enable VMX, which turns on uh, nested virtualization for our image. Once we hit enter, this is going to take about two or three minutes to execute. Great, your image is created when you see the ready status below in the table. Now we can close this um, access console and begin to build our, build our VM instance. In the upper left hand corner, click the three bars to open the navigation menu. We're going to go down to Compute Engine 
and VM instances. This is where we can actually begin to build the VM and start defining some of the properties. If you haven't created any VMs, you'll be brought to this wizard where you can create, import, or, ta or take the quick start. We're going to create. Before we just next, next, next our way through this screen, I want to talk about each field here so you can understand exactly what you're doing and what options you have available to you. We're going to start by giving our VM um, a name. So I'm going to call it EVNG. The next option you have to choose is your region. I've done this a couple of times under a couple of different accounts. And what I found was originally I did it in the US East 4, the Northern Virginia, the Ashburn uh, data center. And what I found there was, is I was locked into a premium tier for the, um, for the networking. And I couldn't change that down to the standard tier. So what's the difference between the standard tier and the premium tier? Um, there's going to be a little help a little bit later, um, but it charges you a little bit more for the premium tier. One, and, and then again, for the different zones as well. What I found was, is once you create a VM in a region, you can't move it from one region to another. You can't migrate it seamlessly. So what you actually have to do is shut down your VM, export all the data, and then import it into a new region. Um, so what I did is actually just knock it down and build a new one in the proper region. So South Carolina for me um, is the closest to my area. You wanna choose a region which is closest to you. Typically, something closest to you is going to give you the better performance, um, lower latency and better performance. Uh, South Carolina, for me, is the cheapest one because it gives me the standard tier options. Zone B is fine. I'm going to leave that alone. Next is our machine type. Here is where we get to choose the resources dedicated to our VM. By default, it gives us a, um, a normal value of one vCPU and almost four gigabytes of memory. This is going to run you about $24 a month, almost $25 a month. That's based on 730 hours of uptime. 730 hours of uptime is just over 30 days. It's not quite 31 days. This, this projected cost increases as your resources increase. So there's a couple of um, suggested um, pairings here. For example, eight, VC, um, eight vCPUs and 30 gigabytes of memory is going to cost you a whopping $194 a month, almost $200 a month, if you keep this running for 730 hours. Now, if you have just activated your Google Cloud Platform account from your existing Gmail account, you get $300 free to spend. You can absolutely run this all month long um, and, and stay within the margins of your free $300. What's even better is, is if you don't keep this running all the time, you only pay for the time that your VM is running. So you don't actually pay for the downtime. There's a couple of small charges when you're down for static IPs and persistent storage and stuff like that. Um, but the, the bulk of your fees come from your uptime. So my plan is, is to give myself some decent resources to run the topologies that I want to run uh, and shut the VM down when I'm done so I can stretch out that $300 for as much as I can. Now, if you're studying for like CCIE data center or CCIE service provider where you need to run iOS XR or XRV images um, or you want to run the um, CSR 1000 Vs and a whole bunch of them or you want to run a Nexus um, and you want to run a whole bunch of them, this is a great option for you. You can stretch your resources, um, not infinitely, but far beyond uh, what most of us have in our homes. Um, and this allows you to do it on Google's dime. So for the labs that I'm going to be working on, I'm going to do, I'm going to customize. So I'm not going to choose one of the predefined ones. I'm going to click the blue customize button, which is going to give us a couple of sliders where we get to slide the CPU and slide uh, the memory over to what we want. So I think to achieve what I want to do, I actually want to go back to the basic view, drop to a lower tier, and then customize. So I'm going to be 
um, building a topology that uses 24 instances of the iOS V image. Um, the iOS V image doesn't consume a lot of memory uh, during startup or when it's running, but it does consume a lot of CPU during startup. So I'm going to give myself four CPUs and four gigs of RAM. For our CPU platform, I'm going to choose Skylake or better. Leave our GPUs alone. So this is at this rate, it's going to cost me $77 per month if I leave it running for a full month. What do I what I intend on using this for is for building large topologies only. For small topologies where I'm trying to study a specific technology um, or a specific um, small scope topology, I'm still going to build those locally. Um, it's just going to be a little bit easier for me um, to do it. But for these, um, for this environment that I'm building, specifically what I want to use it for is building the large topologies with 24 devices on them and where I can spend eight hours on a lab. Um, so after the eight hours is done, I can shut this VM down and it's not going to cost me $77 per month. It might cost me a dollar for the day or it might cost me um, $3 for the day maybe. Going down to the next section, we're going to skip container because we're not using a container. We are going to change the boot disk. Um, this is going to be the, uh, the base image, uh, the one that we created in the previous step. Let's click custom images at the top and select the radio button next to nested vertubuntu is the image we created. At the bottom below, we're going to do standard persistent disk. And this is uh, Ubuntu 1604 LTS with EVNG on top. It doesn't need a lot of disk space for what I'm using, but if you are going to be building larger topologies with the larger um, Nexus or um, um, XRVs or any of the things that require um, an amp, make sure you're giving yourself ample disk space for the topologies and the images you want to host on it. Um, for what I'm going to do, 25 or 30 gigs um, ought to be enough. For identity and API access, we're going to leave it as default. For our firewall, we're going to allow HTTP in to our VM, uh, and that's because the EVNG um, login page and dashboard um, is an HTTP. Let's click the blue link below it for manage security disk networking and sole tenancy so we can get to the networking details. Click the networking link and the small pencil so we can edit the settings. Your VM is going to maintain two, um, um, uh, two NICs here on the Google Cloud Platform. One's going to be internal and one's going to be your public IP, your external IP. I'm going to leave everything default here, but I wanted to point this out. Um, the ephemeral IP for your external interface. Uh, if you're using the IT Hitman's blog, it's going to suggest a static IP. And I'm going to suggest a static IP too um, as well. If you're using Secure CRT or Multitab Putty or Super Putty, where you actually want to build a connection profile for all of the ports and the devices necessary for a topology that you build, so that your VM is in the cloud and is always reachable at the same IP. For myself, for my needs, I don't need a static IP. One other thing I want to point out is when you do reserve a static IP, and I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment, if you don't have your VM running or you don't have that static IP attached to your VM, you have to pay for it hourly. Now, I believe it's cents on the hour, but still it's going to cost you hourly. So uh, Google Cloud Platform is a for-profit um, operation, so they are going to try and give you services that customers need, um, but they expect customers to pay for them. Uh, so I just want you to be aware of that. So if you get a static IP address and you think you can just reserve a bunch of static IPs at willy-nilly, um, it is going to cost you a little bit at a time. Another thing to point out was here was what I was mentioning about the regions, one of the very first things we chose. I put mine in the South Carolina region, and that allows me to change to the standard network service tier. In the um, US East 4 in Northern Virginia at the Ashburn Data Center, premium is the only available network service tier. Um, that's fine. I think here we can get some more information on exactly what that is. 
um, but my uh, rudimentary comparison is premium allows for um, um, greater high availability, greater fa failover, any cast IPs, um, a, a, a lot more richer features to support high availability, um, where standard is going to give you standard availability, sort of best effort. Um, for my labs, what I'm looking for, best effort is going to be good enough. Um, I'm going to leave my external IP as ephemeral, but I do want to walk through the process of reserving an IP um, in case you want to do that. So go to create IP address. Um, you can give it a name. EVNG, and again, you get to choose um, whether you want premium or standard. And then you click reserve, and it will reserve an IPv4 address for you. Um, and that's the IP that uh, your VM will be reachable. I'm going to click, click, click cancel and leave mine set as ephemeral. I'm going to click done as we're done messing with the network interfaces. And at the bottom, we're going to go ahead and click create. Now, if we filled out all of, the, our, um, all of our options correctly, it'll go ahead and create the VM instance, and it will start it. It's going to bring you back to the VM instance dashboard, where you're going to see a list of all of your VMs. In this case, we only built the ones. So we're only going to see one VM. It's going to show us whether it's been started or stopped and what the IP addresses are, and allow us to SSH directly into it from the web. Here's our VM. We named it EVNG. It's in the zone US1B. Our internal IP, uh, which we're not really going to need, uh, but the external IP is how it will become reachable. Um, here's how you get to the operations of this VM, so you can start, stop, reset, delete um, from here. I also have this tied to my phone, and on my phone, I have the Google Cloud Platform app that allows me to check my resources and my VM instances, and you can see here that I have my VM and it is stopped. I can click it and open it, and I have zero utilization. If I hit the three dots, I can go ahead and start a VM. So it's pretty cool because actually on the first night that I built this initially, um, I left it running, and it was the first time I built it, so I built it with 8 vCPUs and static IP addresses and 60 gig hard drive and gave it a ton of RAM. I didn't really know what I was going to need, um, and I left it running all night, and I just picked up my phone that was on the nightstand. I got the Google Cloud app. It linked to your account right away. I found the VM. I clicked stop, and it was shut down. So it's really cool. So if you want to get a lab started, you might be able to start this from the car on your way home uh, and be ready for a lab once you get home and, uh, and into, the, uh, into your office. So here we're going to use the SSH. We're going to SSH into the VM, set up a uh, root, um, do a couple of operations from here, and then we'll do a reboot. This is going to open a uh, HTML5 a browser window. That allows us to SSH directly into the VM. This is where we'll actually set up reachability, so then we can use secure CRT or multi-tab PuTTY or whatever uh, terminal you're choosing. I'm going to be using regular PuTTY to be able to um, SSH into this VM. Uh, the first thing we want to do is assume root and set a password. We want to allow root to log in via SSH. We're going to set up this VM uh, using the user root, but at the end, I'm going to finish off by creating a new user um, and disabling root login via SSH and allowing only pseudo privileges. We're going to open SSHD. We come down here to permit root login. Yes, and we want to allow uh, password authentication. Now, if you're going for a high, highly secured VM, you probably want to use um, authorized keys. Um, uh, but for us, we're just going to do a basic um, user uh, username and password authentication, which will get us in. 
We've edited the SSHD config. Now we need to restart. So let's do service SSHD restart. I'm going to come back here so I can grab our static I or excuse me our public IP. I'm going to open up putty. And we should be able to SSH in using the user root now to finish our installation. Excellent. So now we're able to reach um, our VM via a public IP address, um, logged in as the user root um, from a local PuTTY session on our desktop. Before we begin the EVNG installation, um, EVNG expects the very first NIC to be named ETH0. Let's check what our interface name is. It's called ENS4. Let's go ahead and, um, and name that ETH0. So for that, as root, we're going to edit uh, Etsy udev rules.d 70 persistent. Go all the way over to the right and replace ENS4 with ETH0. And now we need to do a, um, a reboot. Uh, now we're logged back into the machine. Let's check our interface. And now it is called ETH0. So now we can kind of begin our EVNG installation. And for that, I'm actually going to come over here and reference the EVNG cookbook. Um, I found a, a neat way to get everything that I need right out of the cookbook. Uh, this is on page 44 of the EVNG cookbook, uh, which is available from their website. Um, this kind of goes through the process and procedures of installing EVNG on various platforms, um, as well as sort of a step-by-step -step guide and screenshots for installation, operation, and maintenance. Um, I've used this cookbook a lot anytime that I had a question about something. I was always pointed exactly to where it was discussed in the cookbook and um, for, for a lot of um, operation and administrative things. Um, I haven't had to use this for installation before moving to the cloud because I just downloaded the VM from their website and run it in ESXi. Uh, but this also includes really detailed instructions for installation if you guys are a DIY or you want to do it from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this script, which is coming from uh, their website, and it's called the Install Eve NG Pro. And I'm just going to download that locally. I want to open that up. So if this is the installation script, I just kind of want to read what it's doing. Um, it's going to modify SSHD to allow um, permit root login. Uh, we've already done that currently. Um, and then it's going to go ahead and get the GPG key uh, from their website. So I'm going to grab this. Then it's doing an app get update. Uh, it's, at, it's piping that to uh, apt key add. Uh, then it's doing an apt get update, then it's doing apt get install software properties come in, then it's adding a repository, apt update, install Docker engine, install EVNG Pro. Um, it's a whole bunch of stuff in here. So let's start with the, uh, the top thing. We're not going to do all of these things. Let's start with the top. So first thing I want to do is I want to download this key straight from their website. Verify I have it there. Next, I want to do, I'm logged in as root, so I'm going to do a apt key add and the file name, which is eczema. The key has been added. So now let's open up that installation script again and see what our next step is. Uh, apt get update. And then we're going to add a repository. 
So apt git update. And let's add the repository. And let's do apt git update again. And I can see here at the bottom, it brought in our uh, new repository for EVNG. This is great. Okay, so uh, what we need to do is we actually need to run um, apt git install EVNG. And we're going to need to run this a couple of times. And during installation, it's going to ask you for um, a couple of input values for setting up MySQL and a couple of other things. So make sure you stay attentive. Um, this is going to take about five minutes total. I'll probably time lapse this. Okay, our first round is done. Let's press up arrow, run it again to pick up the rest of the things. Okay, looks like that process is complete. I'm gonna up arrow one more time to make sure everything is installed the way it should be. Zero packages left, excellent. Now I'm actually going to log out as root and log back in. We have to complete this blue wizard, uh, which is going to set up EVNG in the background and a couple of administrative items. Once we complete this blue wizard, it's going to kick us out of our SSH session and we'll need to come back in. I'm just next, next, nexting my way through this. Our session has been terminated. Now we should be able to pull up our IP address from the Google Cloud Platform dashboard and uh, pull up an HTTP session for our EVNG. Now this is my first time logging in, so I'll use the default credentials. One of the things I want to point out here, you'll notice we have the KSM status is off. Um, this was, in a pro this was a problem that I saw that was a gap in the IT Hitman's blog post, which is if we're SSH'd into, let me uh, reestablish our SSH session, accept the new key, root. If I check what kernel we're using, we're using the Google Cloud Platform kernel, which is 4.15. Even G needs the custom kernel. I actually don't know if it's a custom kernel or just an older one, but it needs 4.9. So I d haven't found a clean way to do this. And in, um, in the IT Hitman's blog, it does ask you to uh, modify Grub, but it doesn't take care of this step. So what we're actually gonna do is CD over to slash boot do an ls, and you can see all of our uh, files here. <clears throat> I'm going to make a directory called old, just to keep these. And I'm going to move anything that says 14.5 into um, a grub.
this should leave behind only the files that had 49 so if we uh, want to check what got moved into old just to verify they should be everything that has 415 okay now back to the cookbook and also the IT hitman's blog if I scroll up in the cookbook just a little bit on the previous page 43 for example there is a line in here which is doing a search and replace. So I'll paste that in. Uh, there's a carriage return in here, so I'm gonna hit enter. This command will error out. And then I'll up arrow and execute it again. Actually, before we do, uh, why don't I show what that's doing, Etsy, uh, default grub. That is changing this line right here and replacing it with no quiet and, um, and uh, net dot if names equals zero. Uh, so it will keep the uh, eth zero um, interface namings. So now if I nano up again, this value now you can see is changed to say net if names equals zero and no quiet. Okay, now that we've done that, we need to do update grub. It's going to use our 4.9 kernel and I'm going to restart. We're going to give that a minute to boot again. And then uh, we'll try to access our uh, web dashboard. Once we get this fully installed and operational, uh, then we'll um, create our new user and we'll disable um, root from being able to SSH in. Uh, remember, this is uh, designed to be a lab VM. Um, it, is, it has a public IP address now, and it can be reachable from anywhere in the world, which means it likely will be receiving some attack traffic, uh, probably from all over the world. So we want to try and limit our surface area as best we can. This is not uh, the greatest because we have to open many additional ports uh, to allow incoming connections. But if you chose to use only the web console, you would only need to have um, your HTTP ports open, uh, which helps to greatly reduce your attack surface. Uh, for what I'm going to do, I'm going to continue to use PuTTY, which means I'm going to need to open those Telnet ports uh, that are going to expose those um, uh, routing devices. Let's try to visit our web page now. We got an evng login. Admin is our username. Looks like we logged right in. Let's come over to system and status. And here we are green now, right? So now we're ready to uh, move over a iOS V image and actually build a test topology. So I'm going to uh, restart our SSH session. Um, as root. And I'm going to bring over my local EVNG VM that I run locally. So if I LS, I have um, a couple of images here for VIOS. And again, I'm going to do this just sort of as a test. So I would just want to move these a couple images over into the same folder. So if I'm in the QEMU uh, folder here and I LSLAH, I don't have anything. Let's create this guy.
So now I'm going to rsync this file into this folder over here. Actually, I'm going to just going to rsync it into the home folder of home folder of root and move it over. And this is going to be vert and we're going to do root at our IP address. Remove the HTTP, and then we want to do colon and tilde for home. Into our credentials for root. Excellent. So let's do um, move. So now we move that folder into our current directory. I want to get back CD into wrappers, do UNL. UNL wrapper tech A fix permissions. Let's minimize both of these consoles. And we should be able to build our very first topology. Let's add a new lab. We're going to call it test. Let's add an object, node, and we only have one image to play with. It's going to be our Cisco VIOS. I'm going to add three. We're going to prefix them by R for R1, R2, R3. Um, I like to use a CPU limit. Um, it's supposed to um, help from maxing out the CPU um, and start slowing down cycles. Um, I still see some CPUs maxed out from time to time, uh, so I don't know 100% the value that it has, uh, but I turn it on from habit. Click Save. Three routers. Now let's add a network. So I'm just going to put a little hub in there. Uh, connect these. Now I'm going to come over to more actions and start all nodes. And I want to bring up the status so we can kind of see how this um, fares. So this is quite typical whenever I run a VIOS or IOS V um, images. Even when starting them three at a time, um, I tend to max out the CPU. You can see memory doesn't get taxed very, uh, very much, but CPU does. And it'll run this way. It'll run at 100% for maybe a minute, minute or two, especially on first boot. Now, my experience has been if you're starting IOS V or any images rather, and you have a startup config, it'll go down to a low utilization very quickly. Um, but during boot up, from its initial boot until it does the image verification, um, it, it typically maxes out. Now, the more CPUs I think you're going to give you give your uh, VM, 
uh, the more CPUs that it that are available to compute uh, for booting up all of these routers. The recommendation is still to, if you have a large topology with many devices, to boot them in groups. Groups of maybe three or four at a time, boot it, let them boot up, then group another four, three or four at a time, and another three or four, and another three or four. Now what you can do is you can add a startup delay to groups of them, so you can just hit the button that says start all devices, and it'll actually delay groups. Um, so you don't actually have to manually start one group at a time. So you have that available to you as well. So it looks like now we're at about 21 and 13%. We're kind of bouncing around the 20s and teens, which tells me that these images are probably idling now. So if I want to console into it, typically I would click here. Um, and this is going to bomb out. Now, actually, what I want to do, if I can, I'm going to let this bomb out all the way to kind of prove a point. The reason this is bombing out is we never went into the Google Cloud platform uh, firewall rules to allow in the ports necessary to allow PuTTY to connect back which again, which is kind of what I mentioned earlier about the attack surface. We need to open up a whole bunch of ports to allow PuTTY in. For me, I'm just going to open them sort of wide open because I don't know how many devices I'm going to have at any one time. But what I want to do is actually, if I can log out and log back into the HTML5 console, because right now we're allowing HTTP in. So I want to know if I can control the entire lab through essentially HTML5 only. Great, here's the same lab that we just built and they are started already. So if I click on one of them, I typically don't use the HTML5 um, console at all. Um, I stick with PuTTY because that's what I'm going to be facing when I sit for my CCIE lab. So I want the um, experience. So this is great. So I'm only allowing SSH and port 80 into the VM. And I'm going to be able to, looks like, console into each of these devices uh, through HTML5 which is really cool. I really think the EVNG team has really done a great job um, in, in, in creating this product, um, the accessibility for the devices, and kind of, kind of do, building exactly to what uh, network engineers' needs are. So again, this was one router. This is router number two. This is great. Um, like I said, I don't typically use the HTML5 console, um, so I'm really happy to see this. Uh, one of the, I want to point out a log message here, just in case anyone is going to be using EVNG for the very first time with iOS V images or VIOS, however you want to say it. Um, typically, I have found that the routers on the initial boot, again, if they don't have the startup configs um, in them already, until you get this log message, which is the platform signature verified, your router tends to run a little laggy. I don't know if that's the, the right adjective. Um, it seems to always sort of be, um, um, have some delay in its operation. Uh, but after you get that log message, uh, typically it's pretty responsive, uh, just like you would expect. So what I wanna do is I'm actually gonna log out of this HTML5 console, come back in as native, But before I do, I want to allow the ports in uh, that we need. So for that, go back to your Google Cloud platform. Click the navigation menu in the top left. Scroll down to VPC network. Hover until you get the sub menu. And go to firewall rules. 
the firewall here is a pr the firewall rules here are pretty basic. Um, there's a couple uh, initial ones to allow for HTTP in inbound, ICMP inbound, um, RDP, and SSH. That seems to be the default template they apply to any new VM instance. So for our name, I'm going to call it allow telnet. Network default, priority 1000. This is going to bump us to the top. The direction of traffic is going to be ingress. We want to apply this ACL to allow traffic to ingress into our VM. We want to allow the traffic. For the source IPs, we kind of want to allow any IP. We, I want to be able to hit this from anywhere. So my IP address here at home or an IP at work or, or anywhere that I might be. I'm at a coffee shop or a library. I want to make sure I'm able to hit it from anywhere, so I want to accept all inbound um, IPs. Now for uh, ports and protocols, I don't want to allow all. Instead, I want to allow only specified ports. So that's going to be TCP. Now for EVNG Community Edition, the ports that it starts with are 32768 except it actually starts with 768 plus the ID of a device. So it's going to be 769, uh, and I'll just bump that up to uh, 32869, 100 ports. Um, I'll probably never put 100 devices on there, uh, but we'll do 100 ports. I'll go ahead and hit Create. I forgot my specified targets. I'm going to say all instances in the network. So it's going to apply this to all VMs in the network. And it has applied our rule in the ingress direction, applied to all VMs uh, from anywhere to these ports, and it's allowed, and it was priority 1,000, which makes it sit right on top of our list. Let's go back to EVNG. Log in again with this, the native console. Which means when we click on a device, it should bring up PuTTY for us. If I click on R1, hit carriage return a couple of times, and I have a router. Yay! Good. So now we have reachability between two devices. Um, just basic, but uh, just proves that this is working. So how I'm going to leverage this is I'm working towards my CCIE routing and switching, and I've been working through the INE workbook. I've been doing all of that locally here, uh, but in the back of the workbook are some really large labs. I've been doing the foundation labs here locally, which are 14 devices, 10 routers, 4 switches. The section after that are troubleshooting labs, which are 24 devices. And because they're using the iOS V images, I didn't have enough resources here at my home uh, to be able to support that. So I wanted another method. I Googled around and I found the IT Hitman's blog, uh, which was a great resource for me to be able to pull this off. Um, I was a little intimidated by it at first, uh, but I'm very happy um, uh, that I went through it um, and executed. Uh, one of the problems that I have what had was the VM not using the EVNG kernel, the 4.9 kernel. Without that, the VMs would not boot. I could, excuse me, not the VMs, the images would not boot. So we needed to go ahead and remove the other kernel so it wouldn't boot from it and reboot, and it found the 4.9, and then that worked like a charm. So here we are. That wraps it up. Thank you, everyone. See ya.